I wish I was about 25 years younger. Uh, I'd give you my resume, but uh, uh, just uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. John chapter 5. Uh, in John chapter 5, of course, we, we preached not too long ago. He heals uh, the man at the pool of Bethesda. And uh, because it was the Sabbath day, it made the religious leaders upset because shouldn't do things like that on the Sabbath day, you know, and... Another place Jesus told them, said, well, if you had a, a donkey or a lamb or an animal and it was down, wouldn't you get it up on the Sabbath day? And he said, man's much more valuable than that. But in this chapter, uh, in fact, in verse uh, um, 15, uh it says the man departed and told the Jews that he, it was Jesus who uh, had healed him. Verse 16 says, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought how they might kill him. Boy. So Jesus was, this was a part of his ministry where they began to plot how to get rid of him. And in this passage, Jesus gives a fourfold witness of who he is. You know, in our world today, you know, in, in Jesus' time, it, it was a, there were all kinds of debates about who he was. In fact, in Matthew, he, they were going to Caesarea Philippi, and he says, you know, uh, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, one of the prophets or this one or that one. And he looked at them and he says, but who do you say that I am? And so Jesus was at a point where some believed him and followed him, while others were questioning even who he was. They didn't believe that he was the Son of God. Many of them, the scribes and Pharisees, and when you see that where it just says the Jews, that's usually what it's talking about is the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, and, and that. And so Jesus here, in, in these verses we're going to look at, gives four reasons. And folks, I want to tell you, I think we still need the same testimony of what this says today in our world because people are confused about Jesus. There's those who say, well, Jesus, he was a good teacher. But that's about all. There's others who say, well, he was, a, he was a good man. He taught good things. But you know what? If Jesus Christ is not who he claims to be, then he's either a lunatic or a very evil person if he's not the Son of God. And so what does that tell us? That tells us as Christians, we are to be the representatives of Jesus to show the world what Jesus is really like. And that's why we have a church. That's why we have churches, and, and that's why we have the Word of God. And so in this, and it begins in verse 31, he says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. And so I want us to look at these four witnesses that, that are here. The first one you will find in verse 23. Uh, he said, you uh, sent to John and he bore witness of the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man... But I say these that you may these things that you may be saved. Now, the first thing that Jesus said about people finding Christ, 
He says, there's a personal testimony. You know we all have a personal testimony? Now sometimes we get to thinking, well, you know, uh, evangelists have great testimonies and preachers have testimonies, but you know, I was saved, you know, people say, well, I was saved when I was a little kid and I really don't have a testimony. Folks, I'm going to tell you, that's the greatest testimony there is. That a child comes to know Christ and not only can Christ save their soul, but maybe save them from a lot of heartache in their life if they'll follow Christ. They'll miss out on a lot of stuff that some of us, you know, were a part of. And so there's a personal testimony. I've had people say, well, I don't know how to give a personal testimony. Well, all you have to do is tell them what God's done for you. And you know what? When you do that, you're the expert. They can't deny it. Why? Because you're the expert. You were there when it happened. And so a personal testimony. Now, if you need a little outline about how to give your personal testimony, let me give you one. What your life was before Christ. You could share just a little bit. I mean, don't, don't make that like 35 minutes long and tell them how much fun you had when you was lost. But, you know, share. You know, my testimony would be like this. Before Jesus came into my life, I was, I was hooked on alcohol. I was almost an alcoholic before I got out of high school. But, you know, April 22nd, 1979, I gave my life to Jesus. That's a, that's, a, that's a testimony. Now, I had sometimes had different things or whatever, but that's a personal testimony. And then I tell them what my life is like since I met Christ. So a personal testimony is what your life was like before you met Christ, how you met Christ. I met Christ and. Welch Baptist Church, and I can't even tell you what the preacher preached that day. All I know is the Holy Spirit of God was saying, today's the day, today's the day. And uh, I went forward. In fact, if you ever go over to Welch Baptist Church, on that front pew, there's a mark about this wide. Looks like somebody cut into it with their pocket knife. I didn't do it. But when I was pastor, I sat right there by that mark every time. And I sat right there by where I got saved. You remember where you got saved? How many of you got saved in church? A whole bunch. How many got saved somewhere else? Amen. So, you know, there's all kinds, you know, I, I say this all the time. I got saved in April 22nd, 1979, and I've never been able to get over it. There's a lot of people seem like they got over it somehow, you know. Uh, you know. Then your testimony would say, what's Christ done in your life recently? We've sung about, about being thankful. Somebody tell me something they're thankful for. Now, don't everybody jump up at once. Amen. Somebody else. Amen. Anybody got anything else to be thankful for? Amen. Amen. See, sometimes, and I'm not saying this to, to you know, to make you feel bad. But sometimes we can tell people how thankful we are for our salvation. But let, let me ask you something. What's Christ done lately? Anybody got something Christ has done lately? Amen. Amen. That's a gift from God, isn't it? So a personal testimony. Jesus said, you went out to see John. And John told you who I was. John the Baptist, his testimony was, there comes one after me whose shoelaces I'm not even worthy to tie. You come in, and it would, John would say, man, you come out to hear me. I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. And folks, you know what? 
That's all I want to be. I just want to be a voice crying somewhere. Amen. Crying about the goodness of God. And he said, you went out to see John, and he gave you a personal testimony, and he says, man, there comes one after me that I'm not even worthy to loosen the laces of his shoes. He is so majestic and powerful and so much authority. And you know what? They missed it. The second part of this, the second testimony, look at what he says in verse uh, uh, we'll get it here in a minute. In verse 36, he says, But I have a greater, I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has sent me, and here is a key word to what this verse says. He says, I have a greater witness, and my witness is something that God sent me to finish. That's important. A work greater. Now, what could that be? Well, we could look at his works, what Jesus did, and they were a testimony of who he was. He healed blinded eyes. He raised people from the dead. Only God can do that. He, uh, in this case, in chapter 5, this guy was at the pool of Bethesda for most of his life. And Jesus went and asked him, do you want to be made well? He said, you know, I don't have anybody to put me in the water. And Jesus said, get up, take your bed and walk. And he did. The mighty works that Jesus did. But of all the works that he did, there was one work that stood out more than the other. And I think that's why he said, the works that my Father has given me to finish. There's only one work that Jesus did that's completely finished. You know what that work is? I'm glad you asked. The cross. When Jesus was on the cross, what did he say? His last statement. He, he cried out in Hebrew, Telestai, Telestai. It is finished. It's finished. You know all the other works that Jesus did are still going on today. Jesus still heals people today. He heals blinded eyes today. He, 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 he gives us stuff and he, he takes care of us and he ministers to us. But the work of salvation is complete. You don't have to add anything to it. All you have to do is receive it. You don't have to... You don't have to add anything to it. Baptism is ultimately important, and I think that every child of God ought to be baptized, but baptized, baptizing somebody won't save anybody if that's all they got. You could, you could be dunked in the water until your skin wrinkles up and turns purple, but it won't do you any good if you haven't been saved. Jesus said it's finished. Now we might ask ourselves the question, what did, what did he mean it was finished? What is, was it his ministry that was finished? No, his ministry is still going on today. I hope it is here in this church. I know it is. It's finished. There's a song that I, when I was doing evangelism, I sang you know, a lot, because a lot of the churches where I preached revivals were real small, rural churches and didn't have much music. And so they would put up with me, you know, and let me sing. And uh, uh, there's a song I sing, and I learned to sing it because a guy told me I couldn't sing it. And so I learned to sing it. Bill Gaither wrote, it's called It Is Finished. Powerful song. It is finished. 
The work of salvation is complete. We don't have to add anything to it. We don't have to subtract anything from it. All we have to do is receive it. And if we've received it, we become a child of God. And that work that Jesus did on the cross is the mightiest work that he ever did. See, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he died again. When he healed his blinded eyes, that young man or that middle-aged man by that time, his eyes were open to see that his death would come too. And they all died. But with Jesus, we all live. Yeah, this body's going to die. This body's going to wear out. And it's going to die. I, I told him when I die, I'd like to be buried. I told Sandy this one time, I'd like to be buried standing up. That way, when the rapture happens, I can come out of the ground like, a, like a, a, one of them ballistic missiles. Wouldn't that be awesome? I tell you. The works that he did. The works ought to testify to people. And even today, the works of God. Uh, people say, well, what works are going on today? Folks, I want to tell you, all you got to do is look around. God's doing some amazing things. I tell you what, I believe with all my heart, with what's going on in Israel right now, God's getting ready to do something big. I mean really big. The works that he does. And so if we're witnessing somebody and they say, well, how do I know this is all? You can say, well, here's what, here's what Jesus is doing in my life. And he's doing this and that and whatever. He's still working through the church. The works that he did. I mean, just think about it. Our whole calendar changed because of Jesus Christ. The whole world is different because of Jesus Christ. And one day he will step back into human history and they'll see a work of Jesus Christ that many, many, many people is not really wanting to see. The works. <laughs> but not only just the works, look at verse 37. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. Jesus is saying, my Father God is at work. And he's given a testimony of me. I got to thinking about that. You you know, if I was telling somebody about the testimony of God, what would I say? I like what the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 1. He says, at various times and different manners, God spoken to our fathers by the prophets. And then he says, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by Jesus Christ, who purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of God I thought about that. Think about the Old Testament, how, how God spoke in times past. He, he took a shepherd boy and made him a king. He called a, a man by the name of Moses who was born and was hidden from the ruling authorities of the day who would have caused an abortion on him if they could have found him. But he was hidden away until they got to where he couldn't hide him no more, and they put him in a basket uh, in the Nile River. Folks, you know, every time I read that, I think about this. Did you know, have you ever read anything about Nile River crocodiles? They're called saltwater crocodiles. They're humongous. To take, <laughs> to take your baby and put it in a basket in the water in the Nile River where there's crocodiles. That's the protection of God. 
Pharaoh's daughter come down to see him. He opened it up. He's a beautiful child. She raises him in her house. Moses' mother is called to raise the child. And the devil paid for it. Amen. How they spoke in times past. He spoke in fire. He spoke, I mean, so many ways. He even spoke one time in an old flop eared well, I was going to say Democrat donkey. I don't know if he's Democrat or not. But he spoils a donkey. Amen. And Balaam found out that God could even speak through a donkey. He getting ready to beat that donkey for breaking his foot. And the donkey says, why are you hitting me? I'm trying to save your life. <laughs> the works. The voice of the Father. Then we come way up to the New Testament. Jesus goes out to John to be baptized and and he's baptized there in the Jordan River and he comes up out of the water. The Bible says he immediately came out of the water. Now here was the thing. When they would baptize somebody, when John would baptize somebody in the Jordan River, normally they would come up out of the water and they would confess their sin. But Jesus had no sin. And it says immediately came out of the water. And the Bible says there was a voice from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I've had people say, Well, why did Jesus need to be baptized? Because Jesus wanted a complete identification with human flesh. He came to be like us yet without sin. And then later on on the Mount of Transfiguration there was Peter and John and they were up there and they, was, they, they realized that uh, uh, Moses and Elijah was there and they said, Lord, let's build three tabernacles and a cloud overshadowed them and a voice from heaven came and said, this is my son. Listen to him. Didn't need three tabernacles. How many crops do you know that grow on top of a mountain? None. Where do they grow? In the valley. In the valleys, on the hillsides. Folks, I want to tell you something. We can have mountaintop experiences in the church, and sometimes there's crops that come in a church, on, even on the mountaintops. But folks, listen, out there's the valley. Out there's the valley. You know, it's great for us to come in here and we can witness to each other, and I think, man, I tell you what, I wish, the, I wish every seat in this church was full of people so I could preach. It's a lot better to preach to people than empty chairs. I learned that during COVID. Man, it was hard to preach to empty chairs. Out there is where the valley is. So what does that tell us? That tells us that we need to work on our personal testimony and we need to work on uh, telling people about the works of God and, and telling people about what Jesus can do for them and all of that. But there is one more work. Look at verse 39. And this verse is kind of different until you realize who Jesus is talking to. He's not, when he gives all of this, he's not talking to his disciples. I mean, they're there, but that wasn't his target audience. His target audience was the Jews, the, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees and, and all the other Cs. That's who his target was. And look at what he tells them. 
He says, you search the scripture. And if Peter just stopped right there, they'd have said, Amen, we search the scripture. We know the scripture forwards, backwards, and sideways. And they did. Though I've read where it says that most, uh, most Pharisees could quote, almost quote the entire psalm. Man, I have a hard time quoting Psalms 23, you know. He says, you search the scriptures for in them, and notice he says, for in them you think you have eternal life. You know, that tells me that there's a lot of people can know Bible verses. There's a lot of people that can even read scripture. There's a lot of people can out there and maybe even in the church couldn't tell you things about the scripture. But notice what else Jesus says. He says, in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Then notice the next verse. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men. Folks, I want to tell you, I, I, I wish we could realize what a powerful statement this is. He says, there are those who search the scriptures, they read, they might even, they might even be in some seminary, or most of these Pharisees were teachers of the law. They knew what the scripture said. They just didn't know what it meant. And you know we have the same problem in our world today. There's a lot of people that can tell you something about Scripture. There, there's those that even preach the Scripture. And somehow it seems like they've missed it somehow. You say, how, how can you say that? How can you say that about another preacher? Well, Jesus said that. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord. And that was, a, that was a, uh, like a, uh, an extra special phrase that they would use in the temple. He said, many would come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord. He said, we've we done many wonderful works in your name. We cast out demons. In your name. You know, in the Bible, only read of a place or two where a demon was cast. I remember in the book of Acts, there was a guy going to try to cast out a demon, and the demon said, I know Paul, and I know Jesus, but who are you? You know? I think anybody cast out a demon would have to be pretty spiritual, amen? But Jesus said, not necessarily so. He said, depart from me, workers of iniquity. And folks, I'm going to tell you, I've heard some things on TV that preachers preach, and I think, man, lie, don't they read the Bible? You know? Now, I'm not saying all TV preachers that way. I've got several I listen to. Dr. David Jeremiah and Dr. Robert Jeffers and First Baptist uh, uh, Dallas and other places, you know. But I have learned one thing. Don't build your faith around some pre TV preacher that you... Because there's been a couple of them just recently that I listen to quite a bit. Now, that wasn't where I built my faith. And they fell and out of the ministry. So there's only one place to put your true faith, and that's in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus here is telling them. Now, he makes another statement here. You know what? This is different than the King James. Oh, no it isn't. 
No, it isn't. I got it. I, I, my mind went visiting there for a minute. It says you search the scriptures. And you know, I, I thought about that. You search the scriptures. What do you find out if you begin to, I mean, if you just, if you didn't know anything about anything and somebody gave you a Bible and you just begin reading it, you begin to search the scriptures, what would you find out? Well, I think, first of all, you'd find out that God's the creator of all things, and He spoke the worlds into existence, and He made a man and a woman. He made them Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And, you know, you'd find that out. And then just a few little bit later, you'd find out that sin causes a barrier between you and Almighty God, and you'd find out that sin is very costly, and you'd find out that sin is, is... And all they did was disobey and ate the fruit when God told them not to. You'd say, well, that's not much of a, of a sin, but the Bible says rebellion is like the spirit of witchcraft, and so the Bible tells us we all sin and come short of the glory of God. We'd find out that sin put a barrier up. And after sin came, death came. And from that time on in the Bible, it says, and they died, and they died, and they died. And you know what? The last time I checked, death is 100%. We're all going to die someday. Now, I don't want to be flipping about that. Because there's still sorrow and pain in death when we lose a family member or lose a friend or whatever. And folks, listen, if they're saved, you didn't lose them. Because you know where, where they're at. They're in the presence of Jesus. And, uh, you know, but we find that out. Then what else could we find out? Well, you read on a little further and you get over there and and you get in the book of maybe Isaiah, and Isaiah says, Come, let us reason together. Even though your sins are as scarlet, I can make them white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, I'll make them white as wool. If you're willing and obedient, you can have the fat of the land. But if you're disobedient, it's another deal. You find out that there is a price for our sin. The Bible says, The soul that sinneth shall surely die. And we will. The Bible says then, if you go a little further in the, in the Scripture, you find out that God made a way. The Almighty God made a way. And that way was God demonstrated His own love for us that He gave us His only Son. In John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave us His only Son, and whosoever, and I'm glad I'm a whosoever. You know, people want their name up in lights. I'm just glad to be a whosoever. You know? Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. What does that mean? That means not only longevity of life, but it means quality of life. Oh, I tell you, my life's so much better today than it was before I got saved. Man, before I got saved, Sandy and I had problems, and I was mostly the cause of it. And now I'm saved, and I'm Mr. Per I'm like that guy on, on uh, Mr. Wonderful. I couldn't thank Kevin something. Anyway, boy, Jesus makes a difference, doesn't he? Amen. Amen. So what do we find out? Man, we find all that out in Scripture, and then we read just a little further. And it says one day Jesus Christ is coming back. He tells us that for two reasons. Number one, it's a warning to the world that says one day... Jesus Christ will come back and he won't come back as a suffering servant. He will come back as king of kings. He will come back, he will go from a, from a lamb to a lion. 
and he will be the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he will come back as Messiah to the Hebrew people. He will come back as our Lord and Savior. And he will come back to, as a judge of the nations. And he will judge the nations of how they treated Israel. He will judge us as, as believers at the Bema Seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He will also judge the worlds of lost people. And, and even those who pierced Him, it says, they will see Him. He will come in great glory. He tells that as a warning to the lost. But He tells us that it's an encouragement. Why? Just keep on keeping on. World's going to get bad. You think it's bad now? It's really going to get bad. But what does it tell us? Just keep, keep the faith. Keep standing. Keep doing what we need to do. Keep reaching out. Keep trying to get more to come. That's what we're to do. Jesus said in one place, he says, Occupy till I come. That's what we're to do. Oh, if you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus into your life, oh, don't let this moment pass you by. If you're here this morning and you're a child of God, I hope this message has encouraged you. Folks, as a church, we need to be reaching out to our communities. We need to talk about some ways to reach out, to find ways to get people under the influence of the gospel because that work of Christ that even though he paid it all at Calvary the ministry of evangelism and missions and stuff is still going on today and we need to be involved in it let's pray Father we thank you this morning for all that you do in our lives we thank you that you sent us a testimony, not only just the miracles you did, or just what John the Baptist said, or others have said, and personal testimonies. Help us to realize that we can share our personal testimony, and it'll make a difference in people's lives. Father, I just pray today that if there's someone here that doesn't know you, that they'll step out and come. Maybe there's others here that need to be baptized. They need to, they need to follow you. Maybe there's those here that need to join this church. This is the place where they need to worship. Father, whatever it is, we just ask you to bless. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.